Hello and welcome to SAR Histories, where on the channel today we will be visiting the Workhouse Southwell. The Workhouse is located in the town of Southwell, Nottinghamshire, England, and is a museum operated by the National Trust, which opened to the public in 2002. It is the most complete 19th century workhouse in existence, built in 1824 as a refuge for the destitute. This rural workhouse was designed to house around 160 inmates who lived and worked in the segregated environment and the building was in use right up until the 1980s. The origins of the English poor system can be traced back to the late medieval statutes, dealing with beggars and vagrancy, but it was only during the Tudor period that the poor law system was codified. During the dissolution of the monasteries during the Tudor Reformation, monasteries had been the primary source of poor relief, but their dissolution resulted in poor relief moving from a largely voluntary basis to a compulsory tax that was collected at parish levels. The Elizabethan Poor Law of 1601 formalised earlier practices of poor relief contained in the Act of Relief for the Poor, 1597, yet it is often cited as the beginning of the old poor law system. It created a system administrated at parish level, paid for by levying local rates on ratepayers. Relief for those too ill or too old to work, the so-called impotent poor, was the form of a payment or item of food or clothing also known as outdoor relief. This law system would remain in place. The Poor Law Amendment Act was passed in 1834 by the government of Lord Melbourne and largely implemented the findings of the Royal Commission which had presented its findings two years earlier. The workhouse origins began with Reverend J.T. Beecher who had experimented with a small workhouse at Southwell. This experiment dropped poor rates by 75% and Beecher then encouraged the surrounding parishes to pull together their resources and copy his scheme on a larger scale. Thus they agreed and in 1824 built a new workhouse just outside Southwell, the building that we see today. The Southwell workhouse set an example and influence for a new national system. In 1836 it officially became the Southwell Union Workhouse. By 1839, almost 600 unions were operating in England and Wales. This room was used as a morgue up until a new one was built in the early 1900s. The stone lines that you see mark the wall of the isolation cell. A person being punished could be placed inside this cramped cell, alone and in the dark, next to dead bodies. Able-bodied men were made to work to earn their keep, work that involved breaking stones for roads, decorating, gardening and picking oakum, which was an unpleasant and tedious task. Those that were aged or infirm Blameless poor, as they were called, would spend most of their day in this room. The day would be whiled away on the wooden benches with little reading material. They could also go outside into the exercise yard for air. But whether aged or infirm, as you can see, there is little comfort to be found. The cloak was a well-paid position, often taken by an aspiring young solicitor or another professional man. The cloak was not resident, but attended the guardian's meetings to take minutes and to keep records, which would later give great insight into the workhouse. Able-bodied women, like the men, were expected to work and were given jobs such as cooking, laundry, scrubbing floors, needlework, and picking oakum. For any that sought refuge in the workhouse, there are a number of ways this could be done. In an emergency, 
The destitute could arrive at the gate and be admitted by the master to a receiving or casual ward, where they would wait until the next meeting of the guardians, who would decide if they needed to be admitted. But it was more usual for the poor to apply for assistance through one of the union's relieving officers, who would travel around their appointed parish, arranging meeting places where people could put forward their case for aid. But ultimately, the decision rested with the Board of Guardians. Once admitted, a person was stripped of their clothing and belongings and given a wash before being examined by a doctor who checked for any illnesses that might spread. Families were split up onto separate wards, only to see each other on a Sunday for a few hours. The rules were strict and the days regimented into a harsh routine to dissuade others from seeking help. The cellar is an interesting place to explore. Behind the wall of the long corridor is a tank which collects rainwater from the roof gutters. There were no fridges in Victorian times, so the cellar was a cool place in which to store food to keep it fresh. The scullery was the room where hot water was boiled for the many cleaning tasks, as well as the pots would be scrubbed clean here. In this kitchen, the women would prepare meals for over 100 people. We have a misconception of meals in the workhouse, that they were meagre, but the truth is, that people were well fed. For breakfast, a thin porridge was served with bread. Dinner, a dish of potatoes and meat, alternated daily with soup made from the meat juices. And for supper, more porridge and bread was given. Portions were carefully weighed so that no one got more than they were entitled to with men getting the most and children the least. These portion sizes were large and it surprised me as it contrasts with the half-staffed image that Dickens portrays. The workhouse also houses these quilts, which represents 598 women that have been killed by their partners or ex-partners between 2009 and 2015. To look upon the many names is chilling and gives you pause for thought at such tragedy. The boardroom was where the guardians would meet on a weekly basis to make decisions and to hear petitions for entry, but the room also doubled up for daily prayers and worship on Sundays and holy days. The Board of Guardians would be made up of one man from each parish who had been elected and it was not uncommon for those elected to use their position for their own agenda. In this small schoolroom, children would receive an education under the supervision of a schoolmaster and schoolmistress. Infants were taught together, while older boys and girls were separated. Here, they were tutored in basic maths, writing and reading, as well as being in the habit of usefulness.
The old and infirm male sleeping ward is very basic and has just 7 beds for 13 to 15 people. It is strange to see this barren room through modern eyes and fills you with a sense of sorrow, especially as you read about the real people on the pillowcases and headboards. Like their day room downstairs, there is little comfort to be found, nor entertainment to occupy your mind. The able-bodied sleeping ward is similar to the last. In this room, up to 20 men slept. The mattresses of the beds were thin and filled with straw, which would get damp and dirty. There were no cupboards to store clothes, just pegs to hang them on. As you look around, you get a sense of deflation that inmates must have had and the claustrophobic atmosphere with so many in the same room and sharing beds. Inmates were not permitted to have their belongings with them and were taken from them as they entered, only to be returned when they left the workhouse. Once inmates had gone down for breakfast, they were not permitted to return to the sleeping ward until bedtime. It is not known for certain what this sleeping ward was for, so it may have been for elderly couples, which was rare, or as an idiot's wards, which is historical language for those suffering mental health issues or learning difficulties that we know of today. Today, this ward houses chairs once used in the workhouse. The master and matron's bedroom is spacious with a lighter feel to it. The master was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the workhouse and would often be blamed by the guardians when things went wrong. The matron's responsibilities were for the care of the women, children and nursing duties. They were probably not rich themselves and would have had to furnish the room out of their own money. In this room you can see what the master and matron were paid and it is plain to see the contrast between this room and those of the inmates. The children's sleeping ward is much the same as their peers in its basicness. Children under the age of two up to possibly seven, slept in the women's ward. This room was mainly for older children or those with no mothers. It was not uncommon for four children to be sleeping in one bed. The able-bodied female sleeping ward is just as spartan as the men's, but what I liked here was the stories told on each bed.
the aged and infirm female sleeping ward has been restored to how it would have been in the 1970s, which is an eye-opener as some think that the workhouses were unique to the Victorian period, though in truth they continued into the modern age under the guise of institutions. It is difficult to think of women being put in such places in the late 20th century and serves as a reminder that poverty is an ongoing problem. Up to 50 children in the workhouse may have slept in this room with the school mistress, though it now displays Victorian clothing of the master, the matron and the schoolmistress. One can only imagine up to 50 children being squeezed into this one room and left me feeling thankful that we have moved past those days. In the early 1900s, the tendency was to create more specialised houses to different categories of the poor. The Southall Union became Great House after the great river that runs below it and it began to provide specialist care for the chronically sick. The infirmary was built in 1871 and by 1900 most of the unemployed were helped at home while only the mentally deficient, elderly, unmarried mothers and children remained in the workhouse. As you explore the infirmary you get a real sense of change from the old system and yet something discomfortingly similar. Eventually, children were no longer allowed in the workhouse, so instead, inspectant mothers would come to the infirmary to give birth and often give up their babies for adoption. There is a lot of information to read, giving you insight into the people that once worked or were a patient in the infirmary. In 1914, the infirmary was extended to add four nurseries and a maternity ward. From the 1960s to the 1980s, the infirmary was Furbeck Residential House and the rooms were subdivided into single rooms for the more self-sufficient elderly women. This room gives you a sense of how many babies were born in the workhouse. Between 1825 and 1841, 141 babies were born to single mothers and 16 recorded as legitimate. The garden that we see today was once larger, stretching right back past the car park. Many vegetables were grown here, mainly potatoes, to keep the workhouse well supplied. The workhouse Southwell is an interesting place that makes you question your moral compass, the fine line of cruelty and support, and the difficulties of finding a solution to the poor. The inmates at Southwell Workhouse 
Though kept under strict rules and being labelled as idle, fared reasonably well. They were clothed, fed and children received an education that many would not have had on the outside. However, it is important to remember that treatment could vary from workhouse to workhouse. A workhouse at Andover in 1845, inmates were given so little food that they resorted to gnawing bones meant for fertiliser. For me, it lies heavy on my conscience that the poor were treated almost like criminals for simply falling on hard times, and it would seem the best that those in the workhouse could hope for was a firm but fair treatment. If you have enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Until then, goodbye.